I'd say let's get let's get started so we have plenty of time and folks will join us as they join. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Vince Jackson, the executive director of the Greater Northampton Chamey, Chamey, Amy, <laughs> Chamber of Commerce. And I am joined by my colleague, Amy Kelling from the Downtown Northampton Association. And we are happy to uh, have you join us this morning for this important session. We keep asking ourselves, what's next? And how do we keep navigating through these never been seen before situations we're facing? So I wanna say thank you all for coming on and thanks to our panel of experts for joining us today to shed some light on this really important issue around how to make sure that we support employees who need to take family leave and medical leave during this, these crazy times we're in. Amy, did you wanna add anything to welcome everyone? Um, I think that was great. I was just going to say two sentences about um, why Jess and I and you put this together, just that we've heard questions from so many folks um, throughout Northampton who are trying to access the program, figure out what it covers, whether there's any funding left in the program. And um, Jess and I just wanted to pull together folks who knew um, a lot more about it than either she or I did so that they could field your questions, share the current status, um, and just talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts of accessing um, the funding. We're also incredibly grateful that both um, Senator Comerford and Rep Sabadosa have joined us this morning along with some of their team, um, both to share information from their perspectives and I think to learn from all of you about what challenges or issues you might be facing in trying to access um, this funding because there is funding there and we want you all to take the best advantage of it. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Vince, or I'll just quickly introduce the speakers and get it going. Just keep it going. Fabulous. People listen to me enough as it is. Um, so we have two wonderful experts joining us today, Sam Larson and Tim Natkovic. Very briefly about the two of them. Um, Sam is currently an Associate Vice President of Government Affairs for AIM, which is the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. And his particular policy focus is in HR, labor law, and taxation. Before AIM, Sam was the research director for the Committee on Labor and Workforce Development in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Um, he was a staffer for the Grand Bargain Negotiations um, and worked with Chairs Seaback, Broder, and Cutler, and as legislative aide to Representative Gordon. And perhaps most importantly, he comes to us with the aid and the most enthusiastic recommendations of Representative Sabadosa, and we are so grateful he is joining us this morning. Um, but before Tim speaks, we're going to hear, uh, before Sam speaks, we're going to hear from uh, Timothy Netkovic. Tim's a litigator with the Royal Law Firm with nearly two decades of litigation experience. He counsels companies on a multitude of state and federal employment laws, including discrimination, disability and leave, workplace safety and OSHA compliance. Um, he does preventative work like drafting employee handbooks and policies, preparing non-disclosure, non-solicitation and non-compete agreements, and conducting management trainings. And equally important, Tim comes to us with the aid and enthusiastic endorsement of Amy Royal, um, who many of you probably know from downtown. And we are also so incredibly grateful to him for sharing his time and knowledge. I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Amy. Um, as Amy said, my name is Tim Nikovic. I'm an attorney at the Royal Law Firm. Um, we represent employers and employment and labor law matters. Um, and I'm here today to talk about a little bit about sick leave and COVID-19 and what the current status is um, in regards to that and what you need to do in the event an employee comes to you to seek leave. Um, the first question and one of the most frequently question, asked questions that we get here at the firm um, from clients is, you know, I just got a call from an employee and their son or daughter in school has been ordered to quarantine because they're a close contact. Do we need to, do we need to pay that person? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the Massachusetts law um, has varying provisions, but basically in a nutshell, if somebody is either suffering from COVID-19, if they're ordered to quarantine for COVID-19, if they're having the after effects of a booster shot or their original vaccine, and likewise, if it's for the a family member who's been ordered to quarantine um, suffering from COVID-19 or is suffering from the after effects of either the initial shots 
or a booster, then you need to give that person um, sick leave under the Massachusetts law. The good news is that under Massachusetts law, um, there is some funding available to reimburse employers for that. Um, and that lasts currently until April 1st of 2022. There is There was $75 million in that fund um, when it started. And the, pay, the provision for reimbursing the employer um, from that fund is in effect until April 1st, 2022, or that $75 million is exhausted. Um, I have not, we generally speaking here at the firm, we don't get involved with um, the clients asking for reimbursement unless they specifically ask us to. So I don't have any firsthand knowledge on what the current status is of that money in that fund. Um, but there is a provision in the law where you can put in for reimbursement. So the way it works is you would have to pay your employee um, for the time off. Um, if they're a full-time employee, they have 40 hours um, of sick leave under COVID. If they are a part-time employee or they work like a fluctuating work week, they have the average number of hours they work in a week. So you would need to pay them um, for that amount. Then you would go to the, Mac, the Mass Tax Connect website and follow the prompts to put in for reimbursement. Um, they're the last for social, the employee's social security number and information like that. However, taking a step back for a second, if an employee is asking you for COVID sick leave, you can have, they need to put it to you in writing so you have documentation of it um, to present for reimbursement. The easiest way to do this is to have a form um, with the required information in it. Um, if you don't have a form yet with people who've been requesting time off, my suggestion would be to put one together. Um, just the basic form that would have the employee's name, the dates of their request to leave, um, and a statement for why they're asking for leave and documentation. So for instance, if somebody is tested positive, you would need to keep a copy of that positive result. Um, and then a statement that they're also unable to telework. And obviously, whether somebody can work or telework kind of depends upon the specific instances of their own uh, job. If somebody's able to work at a desk and log in remotely, then telework is fine. But if they're in person, say doing sales or working in a store um, and not able to work remotely, then they would need to have that statement. The other thing to keep in mind is if you have um, somebody's positive test result or a quarantine order, that could HIPAA then applies to you. So you need to keep that documentation in a safe place, um, not in the employee's personnel file. You need a separate medical file. Um, if you're large enough that the of an employer that the FMLA applies to you, you would already have kind of a separate secure area for medical records. If you're not, if you do not have more than 50 employees and the FMLA does not apply to you, then I would suggest um, making another secured area and keeping any COVID information that you have, whether it's vaccines or positive test results or quarantine orders or anything of that nature, keep those in a separate securely locked place where only certain people have access to it, whether it's you as a business owner, whether it's upper management, but you wanna make sure you keep those, that information in a place where it's not readily accessible to somebody else or where somebody who doesn't need to see it might stumble across it. So that is kind of uh, the general, actually I should also add, there is a non-retaliation provision in the Massachusetts law, which basically means that if somebody avails themselves of COVID sick, information, sick time, then you cannot take an adverse action on them when they come back. In theory, that sounds nice and easy, I know, um, but in employment law, things get a little messy with retaliation provisions, um, meaning that if somebody takes sick leave, comes back and there's some sort of issue and you need to discipline the person, that could be considered retaliation depending upon what's going on. So I point that out just to keep in mind that if you have an employee who's availed themselves of the sick leave, keep that in mind. And if there's a subsequent issue with them that needs to be acted upon, I would suggest contacting your employment counsel just because there is or could be a little bit of risk there in terms of a potential retaliation claim under the sick leave law. That's kind of the broad brush approach. I know there's probably a lot more specific questions. That's kind of the 30,000 foot view that I have for now. Um, and I'll turn it back to Amy. Happy to take questions later. Perfect. And I'm just going to punt it right over to Sam and let both of you talk and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, sure. I'll go quick because I'm sure people want to get to questions. Um, 
I can, Tim covered the, the broad strokes of the plan really well. I can kind of take a step back and try and contextualize the policy, where it came from, how much money is left, um, how's that going, how it applies to and relates to a couple of federal programs that have expired. I know that's confused a lot of our members. Um, so I'll just, I'll start, um, in addition to my other responsibilities at AIM, I run our reopening task force, which is a group kind of like this. We meet monthly to just kind of hash out how to remain in compliance and how to manage you know, the challenges that COVID presents to various workforces. We're a 3,300 member organization. So we have, you know, we have businesses that have you know, never closed and we have people that are not back in the office at all. So we kind of run the gamut of experiences, large and small. So um, this, this COVID program was, and, and I'm sure our elected officials can tell you all about that as well, but it was passed in, uh, I want to say June of 2021. Um, it was part of a kind of larger um, COVID policy package. There's a lot of, you know, extending a lot of policies in there. Um, but this one uh, sticks out as it was a you know pretty sizable commitment from state leaders uh, to run a what is a fairly unique um, sick leave program. So it's like like um, Tim said, it's seventy five million. Um, I checked with uh, the Department of ANF before I came here. As of last Friday, of that seventy five million. 35.1 million um, requests were made and 26.8 were paid out. So you're still under 50% of a program from something that was funded in April of last year or June of last year and runs out in April. So I, I'm pretty confident that it will, um, the fund will last for the duration. It's up to the legislature if they want to extend it again. It was, it's been extended uh, once before. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, I also to note uh, the the administration uh, the executive office administration finance have to notify employers when the fund is running low so it's kind of the last last call but something we've been at aim we've been encouraging our members to if you do want to seek reimbursement um, do so quickly because there is you know there is a limited amount of money um, and so that's that's the large overall uh, one thing I want to clear up something you know something that's confused our members in the past is how this interplays with the tax credits from the Family First Coronavirus Response Act the or the FFCRA. Um, that was a federal sick leave program that kind of overlapped with our state sick leave program, but now it no longer exists. But um, up until September of last year, you could claim tax credits. And I know a lot of our members preferred that just because it was a little bit easier for them to then instead of doing the dollar for dollar uh, wage replacement that the state does, but that program is no longer in existence. I, I just ha had unfortunately had to tell someone that they were <laughs> applying for the uh, last couple months of tax credits that they are no longer going to get for the federal government. But um, we can talk about um, back applications later. Um, Tim, Tim pretty much nailed the uh, reasons for leave and how you're going to do it and how to apply for it. Um, I can tell you, you know, anecdotally from our members that the, they have had a lot of luck with the application process for reimbursement. I don't, um, people seem to be pretty pleased with the system DOR set up. Uh, one of the nice things the legislature did was the, the statute is pretty sparse. So it's allowed for the department to do a pretty quick turnaround. You know, there's not a lot of uh, intense requirements for employers and employees. I think the goal um, with everybody in mind was to get the money out the door quickly. And that's something, you know, something we at AIM are supportive of. And I know our members uh, really appreciate, you know, kind of the, how, you know, while the leave component can get complicated, the reimbursement end on employers has been relatively easy. So, you know, we highly encourage you to, if you are granting the sick leave, um, we highly encourage you to apply for reimbursement. You know, it's, it's your money. Um, so it, and um, I will just talk briefly about the limits on reimbursement. It's up to 40 hours and it's capped at $850. Um, so, you know, you can use that intermittently. You can go through it all in one week. You can go above and beyond and grant your employers more sick leave. Um, they can either dip into their personal sick leave or you can offer it reimbursed, but the state is only gonna pay you back up to $850. And that, um, that 850 per employee cap is for the duration of the program. If you took advantage of the, of the federal leave in the summer or, or up until September, 
and then you get sick again with Omicron this winter, you can you can double dip that way, but you can't double dip on the on the program as it exists. So there's there, there are some limits. I know some members, um, some of our members, and something we I, I would encourage you to do as well. If you have been granting sick leave for people with COVID, you know, maybe a month ago, but weren't aware of this program, I would encourage you to apply still for reimbursement. I, I know some people have gotten backfilled, some people have had some trouble approving it, but as long as your documentation is consistent um, with members, I, I it's like I said, it's uh, it's your money, and I strongly encourage you to to go out and try and seek reimbursement. One other program I just wanted to flag for you all, and I don't think it's getting enough press, I think it was passed and then hasn't really gone anywhere yet, um, is the uh, Essential Worker Premium Pay Program. This is something we are encouraging our members to take advantage of. It's something the legislature adopted but has not been rolled out by the administration yet, but it's something I just want you to keep an eye on in, in the sense that it is, you know, it's free money for your workers. It is um, legislature appropriated $500 million for this essential. Uh, it's basically a bonus program for workers that worked in person during the pandemic. You have to be low income. I believe it's 300% of the federal poverty line. And you have to have worked in person during the governor's state of emergency, um, which was March 10th, 2020 to June 15th, 2021. But if you were on site in person and low income and you think you're any of your workers might um, might qualify. I, I just encourage you to keep an eye on the program. They haven't rolled out um, any of the qualifications. They're entitled for you know one time cash bonuses of anywhere from five hundred to two thousand dollars. So it is something you know we are you know I, we're strongly going to encourage our members to take advantage of when it hits hits the ground because you know like I said it's you know it's free money and I I think you should encourage um, and try and reward your workers that who were you know kind of you know, out there during the pandemic. And I, I think it's a, it's a worthy cause. So that is um, more or less where we are from a kind of macro view and uh, the employer side. And like I said, I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions. Um, Jess, I'll let you field questions, but I saw that um, Kathy put one question in the chat that maybe would be a great place to start, um, which is if an employee is out for more than one week on sick leave, how long do we need to cover their pay? We were going to uh, go to Joe and Lindsay oh, I'm first so and then sorry. open it up. For, right. so just, yeah. I saw a question in the chat. I got very excited. <laughs> Don't worry, Kathy. We'll get to that question, I promise. But first, um, Joe. Would you like to say hello? Uh, sure, absolutely. And good morning, everybody. Thank you so much um, for organizing this forum. Um, Amy, Jess, and Vince. Um, and thank you, uh, Tim and Sam, for your great overviews. I'm glad you mentioned the essential, essential worker bonuses. They were passed in the ARPA bill, as you said, and they should be rolling out soon. Um, but I really, I, I, I very much appreciate this program. As folks have said, it's it hasn't been drawn down on yet. We do. Um, you know, it does go till April and I'm really so grateful um, to downtown, North, downtown Northampton and the chamber for organizing this and making sure that businesses understand that there's money here um, to help recoup costs because it has been such a difficult time, uh, especially to be a small business. Um, Elaine is here, uh, my district director, uh, and you know, we are here for you um, to help work through any any issues. Um, we, you know, we have through this pandemic fielded a ton of unemployment, but we've also helped businesses um, recoup uh, costs through this program as well. You know, when there have been the odd snag, I agree. Um, this program has been largely without issue, um, but should you have any issues in any of these programs at the state level, um, it is our pleasure to work with you. And so just don't hesitate to reach out at any moment. I'll put a bunch of our information in the chat. Um, and just, I look forward to being in partnership going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Sabadoso, would you like to say good morning? 
<laughs> sure. Well, first, thank you, everybody, for having me here today and for organizing this forum. I, I guess I'll echo a little bit of what the senator said. Um, you know, we, we are definitely here to help you. I know so many of you have reached out. And now you've all met Sam, who has been one of the people I've gone to through the pandemic to get answers to all of your questions. Um, so it's great that we have that that team, both both at AIM and, and at the State House, that can really dig in and work through the cases on a, on a very granular level. Um, I know that this has been a super challenging time. I know that it remains a challenging time. Our work is only as good as what you tell us it needs to be. So we can't fix problems that we don't know about. So the more we hear from you about what's happening, some of you are so good at that. Um, there's already been a bunch of emails this morning, um, but, but please don't be strangers. Please let us know what is happening and how we can make things better moving forward because really we want to see all of your businesses succeed and we want to see all of your workers back to work in a safe and healthy healthy way. Um, so again, thank you. And I'm going to uh, let this go back to questions because I have some that I want to ask after you're all done. So thanks. So I would just ask that um, uh, you, when, if you have a question, just use the reaction button, which should be at the bottom of your screen um, to raise your hand. And then uh, I'll call on folks and you can unmute yourself and we'll go from there. However, oh, look at that, questions right away. We are, I promised Kathy that we would um, get to her questions. So Kathy, are you still on here? Yes, you are. Kathy, would you unmute yourself and ask your question if it still exists? I'll ask for Kathy. Um, if an employee is out for more than one week, how long do does their pay need to be covered? I'll let Tim or, or Sam, can, if you want to just jump in I there. I can take a stab at that. Um, so that's really kind of a gray area. Um, and Sam, I'll, I'll kind of address the other issues that might come up uh, if you want to jump in and I'll leave the, sick, the COVID sick portion of it um, to you, if you don't mind. But just because somebody has exhausted the time off under the sick leave law doesn't necessarily mean that other um, leave or PTO issues don't come into play. Um, so if somebody has been out for more than a week that they would still qualify under, if your company offers regular paid sick time, they could qualify under that. Um, if they want to use PTO that they've accumulated, they could do that. Um, if your company is big enough for FMLA, then depending upon the specific circumstances we're talking about related to COVID, it may or may not be a serious health condition um, for either that person or a family member. So that could come into play. Um, and likewise, um, along those lines, mass paid family medical leave may come into play depending upon the specific circumstances. So just because somebody has been out for longer than the 40 hours um, under the sick leave, um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not entitled to potentially other leave once they've exhausted this. So. No, I think you nailed it. Um, the 40 hours is what you're going to get reimbursed from for the state, um, but you can still provide, there's still options for providing paid sick leave. And there's also still obligations for providing paid sick leave. The state also has an earned sick time statute. You have to accrue it and earn it um, by hours worked. But if you, you know, have longtime employees, they're entitled to you know, up to three days a year. Um, that you have to provide, um, you can also go, you know, you also may ob be obligated by your own internal policies. The only other thing I want to note is in the stat, the statute, um, it, if, if it doesn't mandate, it certainly encourages employers and employees to use the state COVID sick leave first before dipping into any of their other benefits. Um, and, and there is there is that, you know, uh, for employers, look out for that retaliation provision, I, I recommend. I strongly recommend, you know, getting through all of your state COVID sick leave first and then before getting into any other programs. Great, thank you. Britt, would you like to go next? Thank you, thank you for having this. I just wanna say um, how pleased I am, how quickly this program has worked as far as reimbursement. Um, I, I file weekly, um, have filed three different times and have gotten reimbursed within five days of each of the um, each of the filings. So it's amazing. And the um, the Mass Tax Connect, you know, which of course I'm very used to because that's where you file, you know, meals tax and sales tax and excise tax. 
um, is very streamlined, very easy to use. Um, I believe there's also a provision that you can get, re the employer can get reimbursed for other costs. Um, so I interpret that to mean that if an employee is out for a whole week and the employee makes a contribution towards their health plan, that that can be included in it. Is that true? I don't think so. Tim, do you want to take this? And I can... Yeah, can you, Rich, can you just kind of repeat that question? I'm sorry, I saw another question pop up and I got distracted. <clears throat> oh, I believe that it said um, uh, there's a place on the form to fill out for additional costs. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the, if that was the term. So in addition to the employee's uh, wage that you can put in additional costs. So I, I interpret that to mean that if an employee is paying um, a portion of their health insurance, that that can be put into that uh, calculation for reimbursement. Uh, that part is not clear to me. Um, I haven't, in all honesty, we, I have not gone through the process myself. Um, if there's documentation to it, I mean, I think um, you, could, you could put it in and explain what it is. And if it doesn't qualify, then it, you'll be told it doesn't qualify. Um, Sam, I don't know if you have anything to add on that or any. No, else? I mean, if, if the state's reimbursing you for it, you know, have at it. But um, I, I, I know the statute is not clear on that. I think the way it's supposed to work, though, is that you would be pay since you pay, you just continue to pay your employer as if they were working and then seek reimbursement. Correct. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just not sure how the two would interact. Um, I believe they would just continue to make their own health insurance contribution um, under the current scheme. As would you. And then you just get reimbursed for their wages. Um, that that's how I've been interpreting it. But um, if, like I said, if you if you are if, if the state is willing to reimburse you for it, um, you know, by all means, continue to go for it. Thank you. Kira, would you like to uh, ask your question next? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about documentation. Um, so I feel like it's obvious when someone has COVID, they hand in their positive test, but because the pay covers more than just having COVID. So like, for example, I've had plenty of people be out um, with COVID symptoms and they're waiting for their test result or um, I'm trying to think of another example, or like if they get their booster and they're out for symptoms, they get the pay, but what, like, is documentation required? Do we just take their negative test if they end up not having COVID? Do they have to go to the doctor and get documentation that they had COVID symptoms? Or can we take them at their word? Uh, it, there are some there are some areas in the in the statute and the leave required that you kind of just have to you know take it at your at their word especially okay. if someone's not you know someone's not feeling well after a booster I don't know how you prove that right um, I mean I get, but, I was wondering like do I need to collect their vaccination card that says they got their booster or so, can I again just take them at their word so what we recommend even even for the things that you have to take that at their word is just get a written and signed attestation from them that that mm -hmm. that's what's going on and try and keep all documentation consistent across your across okay. your across your employees so um the the moments where you do want to back you know like the better the document you know the more official the documentation the better you know doctor's note is great a, co a vaccine card is great for, you know, then they'll have the booster date on it and that should suffice. But for the kind of gray area ones, I would just get assigned um, at okay. the state. And just keep it, con the, the big thing we tell our members is just keep it consistent. Right, okay. Um, the other question is um, just regarding part-time employees. I thought that I'd seen two different timelines. So is, is it how many they are owed, however many hours they average per week or per 14 days? Under the under the, under the under the law, it's per week. Okay. Um, so you would want to do that out. The one thing that happens there is there's really the thing that gets tricky is legally to me is then what is the average hours per week and are you looking at uh, like a short period of time or do you look at it per a month um, and how do you calculate the average and that's kind of a gray area that I haven't seen addressed in the law. Um, but it is per week, not two okay. weeks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to agree with Tim. And there, uh, 
one thing that's been hard for compliance on our end is there there's no real official regulations you know they never really went through notice and comment because this was an emergency program and needed to hit the ground running um anf has provided faqs and information on their website but there is no official you know regulatory guidance on on the statute so exact questions like that um if this was a permanent program i think would be answered but um you know just use your i we've we've told our members to just use their best judgment when calculating these okay great thank you anyone else have questions that they'd like to share you can really just unmute yourself um and and go ahead and pose your questions or amy vince um Representative Sabadosa, uh, Senator Comerford, if you have heard frequent questions that you think might be helpful to have addressed um, uh, in front of this group, they would be welcome at this point. I have something that I wanted to bring up and I would love to hear um, what Tim and Sam think. Uh, one of the things that we, well, I, I actually saw this morning, the local hospital was saying, you know, if you have COVID, you don't need to report it to your doctor. And I am I'm hearing from both of you that a lot of these programs are being run based on, on good faith, right? You tell your employer, you show a negative test. I just wonder, um, my, my brain thinks about possible hurdles that may come forward down the line. So not necessarily with this program, but if someone has COVID, if they have long COVID, is there, is there any reason that people should be a little wary of the advice of don't report it to your doctor? Is it re, should they be focused more on getting that documentation or do we really just let it slide and follow what the, you know, they're telling us? I understand our hospitals are overworked, but I, I do worry, you know, six months from now, if people don't have evidence that they had COVID, what, what do they do? How do they go back and prove that that's really the case? No, and I think from my perspective, that really kind of goes along with the, with the rise of uh, the rapid test, the at home rapid tests, as opposed to going to the hospital or going to a, a, a testing site and having records of that. Um, I think that the best advice is to keep, if you take an at, if you only have an at-home test that is positive and you don't have any, and you call your doctor and the doctor says, well, a quarantine for five days or whatever the current advice is at that point, I think the best advice is to keep a copy, a record of that test somehow, whether it's taking a picture of the, of the test results. Um, that's usually the most common record that I've personally seen. I'm not sure how long a physical, how long the physical test survives before it starts to fade off. Um, but I would say take a picture um, and document it as best as you can. Um, I would think that if you call the doctor's office, the doctor's office would have a would have some sort of log of the telephone call. Um, but if somebody's tested positive and they haven't gone to the hospital or to the doctor or to or to a free testing site, I think the best course of action would be to preserve that test result as best you can. And it seems from what I've seen, it's been a, a picture of the positive result, um, most likely. I, I, I agree with Tim. I think that's your best bet. I, I had a member have their employee take a picture of their positive result next to their phone, which displayed the date time next to it, if you're, if you're really looking to be specific. But, um, you know, people are kind of just making do with what they have on, on documentation for at-home tests. Because there's, you know, there's very little guidance from the state or from the federal government about how to, you know, even report a positive test, let alone keep it for your own files. All right. Any other questions? or thoughts um, while we have Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford here. Is there any other feedback that you would like to offer while we've got their ears? I just wanted to note that Elena put a sample request form. Um, I agree there hasn't been a whole lot of regulation, but there's a sample request form um, in case it's useful for businesses. And I, I, I don't know, um, Tim and Sam, if, if if you think this is a good boilerplate, but it is one that we've been pointing constituents to, uh, to help standardize, as you say, rightly standardize the practice among employees. 
Yeah, no, I, our members have had great <laughs> luck with the form. And, you know, anytime the state puts something out, um, we encourage them to use that because it's the form they're really be most familiar with and you'll, you'll probably get quick return around time. So thank you, Elena, for putting that in the chat. No, I agree with Sam completely. If the state has a form, not just for this, but for any program, use the state's form because it goes smoother. Right. Well, that's good to hear. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, would you like to pose your question or your thought? Yeah, thank you. I, I just kind of wanted to clarify uh, some kind of like the retroactive aspects of this. You know, I had cases going back to the last week of December and uh, first, you know, basically all of December I had a couple of cases and uh, then, you know, a plethora of them in the beginning of January. And I just want to make sure that I can feel comfortable basically going back to my employees and going, this is the information I need. We didn't really gather the information at that time because it was Omicron, kind of everyone was getting sick. Um, can I, do I just have them fill out this form, kind of go back and find the email communication or text messages from them saying, hey, I got a COVID test, I can't come to work. Uh, can I feel pretty confident in that kind of retroactive, um, you know, attack or should I be trying to gather some more information from them? I mean, I think best practice is always to have as much documentation and as accurate or professional looking documentation as you can. Um, and in terms of retroactive application, I mean, I, what I've been telling our members is just go for it. You know, I mean, the worst thing you've already paid the employees for the sick leave. Sure. Um, worst thing that happens. And so, you know, it's on your balance sheets. Like the worst thing that happens is the state says no to mm -hmm. some of them. So I, I, I strongly encourage you to, to go for it. Okay. And I, I guess I, I don't mean to, you know, continue my question here, but uh, is there any, any way to discuss a little bit more of that essential workers program? Uh, I kind of got blindsided by that part of the conversation. Um, and I'm definitely very interested in it. We've, you know, done our best to keep the, you know, our small restaurant open and, and employed. Uh, you know, perfect example was two nights ago, three nights ago, we did like $300, you know, so I don't know if that makes some of my employees, you know, uh, fit in that program. Um, but I'm just kind of interested in learning a little bit more about that if I can. Yeah, I can just go over the, the broad strokes of the program. The statute, again, is, is very kind of sparse as to what, you know, the actual the law that got passed is pretty sparse. And ANF, um, who's going to administer this, um, you know, kind of has a lot to work out. But the long story short is it's anywhere between $500 to $2,000 per employee. They've got it. They had to have worked during the state of emergency. So uh, May of 2020 to June of 2021, that you just have to prove that they work during that time in person. Um, and they have to be 300% of the federal poverty line, which takes you to, hold on, I have it somewhere. Um, that's eighty. It's a $79,500 for a family of four and $38,640 for an individual. So I'm if sorry. you're- One more time on that individual. Number. Yep, seventy nine five for a family of four and thirty eight um, six forty for an individual. Okay, thank you. So if you follow how whether you get five hundred or two thousand and how the state determines that is um, it's currently there's there's no answer on that and there's nowhere to apply for it yet. But right. when it hits the ground, you know, just keep an eye out for it. I'm sure your legislative officials will encourage you to um, take advantage of it because. Right. You know, we want our, you know, like we have mainly employer members and we, you know, we want them to be able to reward their employees, especially if it's not going to cost them anything. That's all I'm looking to do. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Oh, Sarah. I'm not sure if you're clapping or raising your Sorry, hand. Sorry, I was clapping and raising my hand. I hit the <laughs> wrong one. <laughs> so I just kept going. Um, for this program, um, does the employee have to have been with you that entire time? Or could they have had one job with one business and then they have switched to another company and worked for them? Great question. Again, I'm, I'm, my answer is going to be it depends for everything because the statute is okay. it's, it's sparse. But it seems like 
in actual individual, unlike the sick leave program, actual individuals are going to apply um, okay. to receive bonuses. So my guess is it would just be attachment to the workforce in general, the way it's written and not attachment to your specific business. Great. Thank you. Rich, go ahead. Um, I'm just looking at the, um, uh, at the website for this reimbursement and one line, and this is what I was referring to before. It says the maximum amount an employer can be paid is $850 parentheses, including costs of benefits. Mm -hmm. So I interpreted that to mean that um, I could add in benefits for an employee up to that $850. Um, so, uh, so in other words, I'm, I'm obviously you know, paying the employee anyway. I'm just looking for reimbursement. The mm -hmm. employee would normally be paying um, you know, $10 a week for their dental insurance. Um, can I put that in as a cost of reimbursement? Um. <laughs> Go for it. I, I don't know. It sounds like you can, uh, based on that read. Uh, Tim, do you have anything to add about? How no, I mean, if it says cost and benefits, then I think that I, you could probably add whatever you have for benefit costs for that employee. So I, if okay. it specifically says that, I, I mean, again, I haven't got through the form myself, uh, but if that's what it says, then I, I, you can put it in there. And like Sam said before, if they say no, they say no. Um, but if it provides for costs and benefits, then yeah, you can more than likely include whatever benefits you have for that employee as well. Okay. I have been reimbursed. So I, you know, whether they're going to come back in 10 yeah. years and get me or not, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Tim, go ahead. Hi, Tim from Petrora Classwork. I see a lot of my customers on this chat, which is kind of <laughs> funny. Um, hi, Sarah. <laughs> it was some of you. Anyways, um, my question is reimbursement of tests. If I uh, tell a tell a employee that maybe they've been around somebody, and I tell them that you know I want you to go get tested, and you know number one, are we supposed to be supplying them? What I was doing is I was reimbursing the employees if they um, handed in receipts or they used the company card, um, and then of course it would just be a regular tax deduction for me. But is there reimbursement also, and for those type, I've heard that people could get reimbursement through their health insurance. Um, but that's their personal health insurance, not through the company. So what have people been doing with that? Um, I know our members have gone two ways. Um, the most common thing is what you've talked about is they just take the tax deduction on supplying tests, you know, at home tests to, to their employees or partnered with, you know, a CIC health is a name member and, you know, partnered with them to do, you know, either pool testing or, you know, uh, for those people that are back all the time. Um, on a regular basis. And I, if you want to reach out to me, I can kind of talk to you about options of what people are doing. And then the other, um, the other way to go is just encourage now that the Biden administration has this mandate that insurers have to cover individual, you know, tests for individuals through their own health insurance. A lot of people have just encouraged their employees to just, you know, go out and buy their own tests and you know, recoup the cost through their health insurance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is there a limit to the uh, uh, dollar amount or the number of requests uh, a business owner can submit? I understand the 850 per employee, but is there a limit to the number of reimbursement claims or dollar amount? No, no cap on claims, no cap on, no cap per employer. It's just uh, per individual claimant. Got it, thanks. Tim, did you have another question or is that, is your hand just still? Okay, <laughs> no worries. Right. We have a few more minutes. So if anyone has any further questions, now's the time. Yes, I do have one last quick uh, question right. kind of based off that last one. Um, $850, uh, I guess, because it's already been paid out through the company, we wouldn't have to re-worry about any payroll tax implications on that or, or the like, would we? Is that kind of like going to end up being a double dipped on the payroll tax situation? I, I, I honestly don't know, but it wouldn't be payroll because it, you've, already, you've already paid it out and 
hit the payroll tax on that. Right. So it's a state reimbursement. And I don't know if they, if there's any, I don't think, I doubt there's federal guidance on whether sure. um, Massachusetts COVID sick leave is taxed. We don't even have federal guidance on our paid family leave program, which has been up for years now. Um, in terms of state DOR guidance on your, on your, um, on these reimbursable payments, I, I, I honestly don't know. That's a great question. And I can reach out to the department um, and try and disseminate that through the chamber, but I, I'm really not sure. Okay. I would hope they would be tax free, but. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been just chock full of information. Um, Tim, Sam, uh, Representative Sabatosa, Elena, Senator Comerford isn't here right now, so please send along our thanks. Um, Vince, would you, Vince or Amy, would you like to, to wrap us up um, uh, and uh, close out the session? I'll give Amy the last word, but let me just say thanks to all of you. When we learn together, we're stronger together. And the, the questions have been very informative. And as we get calls, uh, we'll be more informed and can, and can support uh, all of you as well as uh, other small businesses in the area. So thank you for jumping on so early this morning. And thanks also Senator Comerford and Rep Sabadosa, you're always just uh, accessible and, and in the weeds on these things. And we can't thank you enough for your great representation. And um, also to uh, Tim and Sam, thank you so much. Amy? Don't know what I could add to that other than thanks everyone for getting on yet another millionth Zoom call, um, <laughs> especially at nine in the morning and good to see everyone. Yeah. Zoom's good for some things though. <laughs> All right, thank you. If you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to myself, uh, Jessica at NorthamptonChamber.com or Amy. Um, and uh, we can uh, send over any follow-up questions. Uh, we will have a recording of this available on the Chamber's website in the next couple of days. Um, again, thank you all so much and I hope you have a great day. Stay healthy. Vince, thanks, Amy, thanks for having me. Thank you for having me as well. Sam and Tim, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks.